Hi, Susan. Good morning. How are you? Good morning, Seals. Nice to see you. It's nice to see you. And this is an episode of the podcast where we will be seen because we're going to put this one on YouTube. And so right away, we should mention that we have a guest. <laughs> Hi, Ann. Hey. Um, let's welcome Ann Johnson is joining us today because we're going to talk about efficiency. And Ann is the efficiency guru. Although we just spent this morning talking about how inefficient we all can be because <laughs> right, right. we all forget, <laughs> we slip. So this, this podcast is going to be a reminder to us. Yes. So we can hear our voices in our head saying, put on that tool belt move that trash can. <laughs> yeah. So I, I took Anne's efficiency class several years ago. In fact, it's, um, we just finished January. I took it in January. I still hear Anne's voice in my head, <laughs> the kind way reminding me to do things more efficiently. So, um, let's start by talking about, um, why we decided to do this episode. We had a burning question. <laughs> Oh, it's so funny. We had a burning question from Jean Laws, and she wrote and said, what does Susan mean when she says that she doesn't iron very much? And um, that was a great question. And then as I started thinking about it, well, one of the reasons I try not to iron very much is for efficiency. Mm -hmm. So that brings up a whole topic of efficiency. So that's something we're going to include today as we go down our list of right. simple steps that you can take in your workroom to be more efficient. And I have to admit when you said that that was a great topic for a podcast, how we got to efficiency from I don't need <laughs> your iron, I, I missed it in the beginning and then you explained and I went, oh yeah, well, most of the time it probably is more efficient. I was thinking along the lines of not over ironing fabrics or not shrinking oh, skin. All of those are all true. part of the efficiency. Yeah. You wonderfully worked it into efficiency. So I thought that was terrific. And um, we are all joining from our workrooms today, which I think is really cool. Yeah. <laughs> I love the backgrounds of everybody. I know. <laughs> so if we need to show anything, I can um, you know walk around and, and point things out. Okay. And if you're looking at this on YouTube, you see a fourth screen and it's me at a work table. I have my iPad hooked up. I am going to move around a little bit and I thought it would be a little bit easier if I didn't have it on in the beginning. So when I'm, we're ready to show some things around the, the um, sewing machines, then I'll, I'll move my iPad. So what do we want to start with? I, I vividly remember one of Anne's biggest rules. All right, Anne, I'll let you start. Not rule. Wait a minute. Tell me what that rule is that you've been <laughs> And it's not rules. They're guidelines. You're oh, right. thank you. No, You're right. Yeah, thank guidelines. you. Thank you. So what's that rule? It's oh, different. yes. Yes. <laughs> that's a rule. That's a rule. Yes. That's a must. Must. All right. Yeah. Now we have an exception. Have... We have one rule. Okay. <laughs> We're talking about tool belts for those of you who are listening to the podcast and haven't had a chance to put it, get, get YouTube up yet to watch. And Susan and Ann and I all have different types of tool belts. So Ann, why don't you tell us why we should be using, why we must be using tool belts? Um, it, honestly, every time that you're at your table and you are pinning something and you stop and you have to walk over the other side of the table, to get your scissors right there, you need a tool belt. And in the tool belt, you keep the things that you use the most all day long. And um, mine's packed full of stuff that I use constantly. And you, it's hard at first. I mean, when you first get your tool belt, you load it all up first thing in the morning, about an hour later, it's empty, right? And, <laughs> then it's like, ah. and um, but once you get in the habit and start, you have to be very mindful at first. So like you have to kind of like chew yourself out every time you take something out and then have to go run around the table and go get it back. And I can always tell when I'm getting tired, you would think I would get more be just because it's such a habit that I would still be putting stuff back in. But when I get tired at the end of the day, stuff starts staying outside of my tool belt. And that's yes. kind of my, um, can be a signal to say time to quit, time yeah. to walk away. But yeah. um I mean, everything goes into a certain pocket and I've come down here thinking, I'll just work for an hour. I don't even want to put the tool belt on, right? Who wants to put that on? And after about 10 minutes, I'm like, I got to put that tool belt on. It's driving me <laughs> not having it on. I'm so used to it. 
And I've done exactly the same thing where it's if I come down after dinner or it's just I'm working on something for myself, that's when I most often do it like, oh, well, this isn't a a job, so I don't need it. And you're right. Ten minutes later, I'm totally inefficient. Things are all over my work table, but I hadn't realized about being tired. And you're right. When I came down to my workroom this morning to get set up for this. There wasn't a single tool in my, in my, I'm wearing an apron for those of you who are listening and not watching. And I'm still not a hundred percent sold on it. I haven't quite decided if it's what I'm going to stick with. Um, I like that it has a crisscross shoulder, so it's not a lot of weight. And I really like where my scissors are held because I've never, they've never fallen out of the loop and I've never stabbed myself in the thigh with them because it falls to the side. So, so right now I'm, I'm liking it, but if I, if I don't put it on within a few minutes, I feel like I'm just chasing around the table. Exactly. Exactly. Susan, did you start out wearing a tool belt? Uh, no. So, uh, gosh, but it's been, I've been wearing a tool belt for a long, long, long time. Okay. So I started out just having something to hold my scissors because as Ann mentioned earlier that's the number one thing you're always going for and it's always on the other end of the table yes and um short of having a leash on it you know you need to have have it next to you and uh, so I use this this pouch and it's um called a rear guard this is my this is my original one my favorite one <laughs> <laughs> and it has this little uh hard flat area in the back that is supposed to go into a back pocket so like it's for sort of a a men's thing right so a man that has on a tool belt can put this in his back pocket and it has a place for the tool belt to go so it can be on the back side okay or screwdrivers and things and uh so i adapted that by making a belt and this is a belt out of a scrap of umbrella fabric that came out of the trash, right? And it has Velcro on it so that uh, it fits no matter what kind of day I'm having or what I'm wearing, <laughs> it's very adjustable. <laughs> and I wear it low and it hangs on my right side because I'm right-handed. And I've tried to wear aprons because my clothes get ruined in the right. workroom, mm-hmm. but um, I don't like leaning over and having a tool apron between me and the work table. Okay. So that's why the tool pouch has worked really, really uh, well for me. And this one is from Duluth Trading Company. And you also can find them um, like at a big box store in the gardening department. They have them for people that do a lot of gardening, have mm-hmm. a pouch sort of like this. And um, one tip for a tool belt is the scissors that are in my tool belt are the Kai, um, let's see, they're 5250. They have a blunt end. And uh, my other Kai scissors that are really long and sharp and pointy don't work as great in the tool belt. Right. So, so these are my go-to every day in the tool belt shears. Okay. That's well thought out, Susan. And I think that anyone who has hesitated to wear a tool belt should think about some of the things that you just said, because everything is adaptable. I, I have used the original um, belts that were for purchase at CHF Academy. Mm-hmm. And that's, I kept losing my scissors because I had the great big scissors in there. And, and then I would put the shorter scissors in, oh wait, and they would stay in place. So there are things I think we just have to adapt a little bit. But yep. along the lines of organizing our tool belts and like Ann said, she's got a mess of stuff in there that she uses all day long. What other ways can we be organized in the workroom? as far as tools are concerned. Do, you, do either of you use carts or bags or is there anything in specific, anything specifically you do? Susan, yes, uh, we'll go, or Anne, we'll go with you first. Go with me first, okay. Uh, first of all, this wall behind me, everything's right there where I could grab it. And this is the corner of the table that I work from the most. We all work at a certain side or corner. Yes. And right here are the other things that I need the most. So everything I have is in quick reach. And the the tools that I need the most or that I am constantly using all around the table are in the work belt. Okay. Susan, how about you? Yeah, I um, like to have like things together. 
And I do that in my kitchen too. So yes. all my rectangles are together in my <laughs> <laughs> and all the, the round things are together in my casseroles, you know, um, and uh, in the workroom, all my threads are together, all my rolled goods, like all the shear and tapes, Velcro things on rolls are together, um, fusibles are all together, mm -hmm. Roman shade supplies are all together, and that way I can easily find things, and um, of course here at Workroom Tech, I have things set up a little bit differently because we have to work with students, but another thing I love are clear bins, um, I can turn around and uh, show you so there's um yeah. buttons grommets right um, zippers are below all of those are uh in clear bends and you can see what it is uh, what you're looking at and i really like that to kind of look over and don't even need to have a label on it yeah I, i'm an I out of that. sight out of mind kind of person if it's not in a clear bin i will forget i own it yeah. and, buy, <laughs> and buy more of it <laughs> yeah so I'm curious about workroom setup. We have three different spaces and you and I both work in our basement. Um, I'm curious about the way we've set things up and how do you have your machine set up? Okay, so I am, I set these up when I first started and before I knew I was a workroom, okay? So let's go take a trip. If you see any, I'm, I'm going to very carefully make sure you don't see any of the mess. <laughs> right, because workrooms are neat and tidy all the time. Always. <laughs> oh, this is kind of dark because of those windows. But um, this room was actually has been an office the whole time the house, since the house was built, because the architect um, built the house and used this as his office. I don't know if you can see. Are you seeing yeah, anything? Okay. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a mess. Man, I should clean that up. <laughs> and, um, uh, and so I originally set my tables up in this pinwheel uh, format because I didn't like fabrics hanging off over the, uh, oh man, that's just so, here, let me try going to this side, um, falling off the tables when I work, okay? okay? Is that better? Yes, that's great. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, I can't tell. And um, so this has always worked for me, and I, and I know that I could set it up so that I have the tables all in the same room as, or excuse me, the machines all in the same room as my tables, but um, uh, I don't want to. Um, I mean, I have accepted that this is very inefficient, but what I have done is when you first walk in the door, there's the Juki, that's my straight stitch. It's the first one I always use. From there, I can just slide things over to the serger, or when I'm done sewing seams, I can just slide stuff over to the blind hammer. So okay. it is set up to, um, as much as possible, maximize uh, flow in that room and um, minimum steps to get in and out of there. Plus, I've um, kind of set up a lot of my tabling routines to make as few trips over. It's like I taught you in class. You do right. as much on the table as possible and try to eliminate steps to the machine. So. Right. That's just I think your machine setup is inspiring for people that have limited space. I have Agreed. so many students here at Workroom Tech that are starting out. They're in a small bedroom and they want to buy a second sewing machine, but like, I don't have room. Right. Uh, you no, know, there's, actually, there's all kinds of ways you can configure things. Yes, it is. But that actually, I think, takes up more space. I, mm, I, interesting. It ta that takes up the whole room there. Whereas this space, I think, is like 14 by 24. And technically, if I moved like this all up high or down under, you know, um, a, a table next to machines, I could probably just squeeze in a line of machines along one wall mm -hmm. and have it right in here. I think that's a challenge. I think yeah. we should have a, an Ann Johnson intervention and we should show up and rearrange your, your machines. Then you'd be so inefficient because you wouldn't be able to work. <laughs> so I'm going to you right out now. of here. This, what this does is it gives me room for the two half width or two quarter tables to be able to bring them over here. And yeah, I wouldn't absolutely. be able to do that with it. And you just try and come in here and rearrange my, <laughs> what happens to you. Oh, challenge accepted. Here we go. In right I know Ohio. <laughs> so I do have the line of machines and mm -hmm. I have a long countertop behind my machines. I don't know how clearly you can see that. So that's I great. That looks my, great. Seal. That's my walking yeah. foot. Then my serger. 
and my straight stitch, and then my blind hammer over there in the corner. I don't use that as often, so that's the least um, easy to get to. And then I have this counter that runs the entire length of it so that I can slide things or, or store things as I'm doing right now. <laughs> That's probably the most common setup I've seen in workrooms. And that comes from uh, factory workrooms where they, they literally have right. somebody that is blind hemming and sliding it to the next person. Yes. Right. That right. is then, then, you know, sewing the pleats or, or whatever the next step is. Yeah. Um, and uh, a lot of workrooms have it set up like that with that long counter on the left. Mm -hmm. I never had that. My mom and her workroom, um, had the sewing machines with the sewing machine head against the wall and the table out into the room. And I've tried and tried and tried to have a counter or a table next to me on my left. And I just can't function that way. It just doesn't work for me. It's like trying to ask me to write left-handed. It just doesn't mm -hmm. work for me. Got so it. all of our machines are um, facing the other way. I'll show you that. And they have the head against um, the wall. And I have uh -huh. uh, tables I can bring in, folding tables that I can bring in if I want to um, have a long table uh, to keep white fabric off the floor, for example. Okay. Or they're close enough to the work tables where I can move a work table over or I can move, it's easier to move a machine over. Right. And um, I've certainly uh, did that recently when I had these huge velvet panels I was working on and I just moved the walking foot over. So when I was pleating the drapery stayed on the work table. So that's a really good point, Susan, about being able to move your tables. My machines or your either one, tables or machines. All of my machines are on appliance rollers, um, which means they only roll in one direction. And that's, if I do some more work in my workroom, I would update that those to casters instead, because then you have a lot more flexibility. But I can move them. And not being able to move your machines easily can really be a challenge. And are yours easily movable? They slide. They're on um, uh, furniture slides, and mm -hmm. this is a old tile floor. So I could. Uh, I'm trying to think if I've ever done that though. I don't remember. Okay, don't but remember it's nice to have. Ever. It's nice to have the option. It's an option. It's yeah. always an option. Yeah. yeah. And to have your uh, for efficiency, have the machine you use the most the most well, accessible. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Focus exactly. You. You'll be turning and working on that. And um, mm -hmm. we all have favorite machines. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. My space behind my uh, blind stitch, I probably could have left an extra foot behind me. It's a little bit cramped back there. So I bought a stool, a rolling stool without a back. Uh, Angie mm -hmm. Weewall had shown us during one of our RAM meetings and I was like, oh, I have to get me one of those. It just, if I can slip into that space a little bit easier, the chair is smaller and I'm, I'm not there very long most of the time. Right. So yeah, that's, that's got the least amount of light and the least amount of space because I don't use it the most. <laughs> <laughs> so what about tools? What tools do you keep near your machines? Oh, well, the, the drawer in the machine always has a screwdriver mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and for the serger and the blind hammer, tweezers. Tweezers, um, right. And, um, you know, all the bobbins and feet and things like that that you need. I try not to fill my drawers at the machines full of junk. Mm -hmm. And if you do have your machine set up where you have a table on the left, you might not be able to use your drawers that are on the machine. Right. So then you need a set of, um, you know, like a plastic set of rolling carts or something um, that you can have all that stuff on hand or uh, put up a magnetic strip that you can, you know, put things up on on the wall. Um, so there's a lot of uh, ideas you can get from um, storage um, companies and kitchen companies and mm -hmm. uh, just just to store all those little parts and pieces. I yeah, I those those. Go ahead, um, I think those drawers underneath the um, tables, uh, uh, the machine tables, I think you can take that frame and if you've got like one of those long side tables and it's Formica or a Formica type table, you might be able to just screw that frame up under the side table. That's too. an excellent idea. That's a, idea. That's yeah, a great yeah. idea. Yeah. So I keep either a, a plastic bin or I have an old um, file drawer next to a machine. Mm -hmm. And all the tools that I need for that machine are there. Even though it's only me working in my workroom, I've got scissors, screwdrivers, tweezers, 
the air ripper. What was that? <laughs> Steam, Steam ripper, ripper. <laughs> clean, <laughs> cleaning yes. brush. Small rollers, the cleaning brush. Yes. They're yes. at every single station because mm -hmm. getting up to go back to my mm -hmm you know, other machine to pick up something is annoying. Although, and at the end of the day, I noticed that tools have moved from one machine to the other. <laughs> I know. It's they like, grow feet. and <laughs> <laughs> They do. They tell or the, or the, the little munchkins in the middle of the night are moving stuff around every time. Another thing I've started putting in is a uh, uh, nail file. Yes. yes. At each machine. Just yes. so. I have a nail file in my tool. Right there. Very <laughs> I've never thought to put one there. Um, and as far as larger tools, um, we don't have a workshop set up here at Workroom Tech. And, mm -hmm. and at home, my workroom, we have a garage. So it's attached uh, to the basement because my workroom's in the basement too. So all of our tools are pretty well organized there. Um, here though, we, one thing we do have that's pretty cool are the um, air compressor hoses. Mm -hmm. So our air compressors are in our storage room. And then the... Um, the hoses come out through the ceiling. Oh, <laughs> Do you recognize wonderful. the tube? Yes. <laughs> Brilliant. And then they travel across and are hanging at each work table. Wonderful. Um, so, you know, we're, we're a school here. So we have six stations for the air compressor <laughs> hoses. Um, but even if you're just one person, just to have that set up for one person right above your work table, it's really super. Um, Roger just made some uh, little post with hooks on them, like bicycle hooks. Mm -hmm. And uh, yep. So, so I love that. I love it. <laughs> they're not on the floor where you'll trip on them, Susan? No. And I don't particularly like the coily kind of uh, right. air compressor hose. So uh, these are, you know, right where we need them. And also um, the air compressors are not in here with us and they're not in the way. We have the quiet air compressors, but still it's really nice to have those in another room. Yeah, right. that is great. Okay, we talked about having little stations. I have, uh, I attend a lot of my installs. So I have an install box. It's, a, it's called my Stanley. It is a rolling box. And yes. sometimes I just leave it in my car, but it has mm -hmm. everything in it that I might dream that I might need for an install. Mm -hmm. And I have um, a measuring bag mm -hmm. and I have um, a bag with my steamer in it. And I have a, like a heating pad that has the um, silver fabric on it. It looks like an ironing board cover. Um, so that if I have to put that behind the steamer with my hand to really press out some wrinkles, I have that in. And they're all just set up. They're ready to go. I don't, I don't really think about them. If I have an install, I just grab the bag and, or grab my Stanley and put it in the back seat of my car. Um, but I keep them ready all the time. That's great. That's yeah. a, that's that's smart. So yeah. And I have a bin for installs that just has weird stuff in it. Like extra, you never know what you're going to need. Oh, there's some you know, extra stuff. carriers yeah. or an extra this or an extra that left over from other projects, different types of brackets, yep. you know, just, uh, you know, the needle and thread and yep. uh, mm -hmm. piece of tapes. And it's like all these weird things. So it's like, you know what? That might come in handy someday. I have jewel, I have jewel <laughs> tape in there. Yeah, yeah. I have all kinds of things in there. All right. So let's get to the burning question. Oh, how, yeah, the ironing question. Yeah, let, how is ironing less more efficient well i learned early in my career that ironing draperies before you bag them was a waste of time <laughs> i was ironing i was literally ironing i would make draperies i would iron the draperies on you know on my back up ironing ironing pulling them forward or pulling them across the table keeping them folded neatly and ironing and ironing and it would take an hour and then you fold them up and then you put them in a bag and then they get thrown in a van and then yeah. they get maybe stored across a, you know, a chair or on the floor somewhere. And then they finally get installed and all that ironing was a waste of time. Um, so that was the number, the first thing I stopped ironing. Okay. And you can steam it out on the installation um, or just fold things nicely and you don't have to worry about all that ironing. <laughs> and then for doing things like uh, folding over side hems, you can mess up your side hems by iron over ironing. Okay. So uh, light ironing or Roger calls this my little wooden iron, <laughs> my, <laughs> using a ruler and just mm -hmm. creasing, creasing it with the ruler. Mm -hmm. uh, I do that 
constantly, constantly. Um, on almost everything I do, I'm not ironing. I'm actually creasing it with my little wooden iron, my okay. little wooden ruler. Okay, <laughs> I like that your little wooden. <laughs> And how about you? Have you have you done anything special with ironing? Do you do less of it because it's more efficient? Yes, I used to not iron panels and lining as I was tabling. Um, uh, I'm back more into that just because I like what I, I like the iron does, and I'll talk about that. But um, the bottom hems of lining, it's only a two inch double hem. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, you just can finger press that mm -hmm. and take the machine and run it through. Mm -hmm. um, I find with shears and that sort of thing, if you press, I like my hand stitching to be invisible, which means running the needle through the fold of the shear. Mm -hmm. right. If you give it too tight a crisp um, crease, you can't get your needle through. Yeah. Right. You know, you're, you're kind of uh, working against yourself there. Um, unlike Susan, um, so I fan fold everything before I send it in. And if you table it and fan fold it and then put in your um, uh, header, mm -hmm. uh, you are protecting it from getting it all. I mean, you've just tabled it. You've just pressed it all out, made it nice and flat, gotten all the wrinkles out and you get the side hems in, if you go ahead and fan fold it right, right away, it just needs a, maybe a touch up. Some fabrics need a touch up, not all of them right. with the iron. It's not a full ironing. And then when you've got it bound up and fan folded, you can handle it all you want. And when you hang it up, it just falls right out and right. Um, doesn't need a lot of steaming. So I've gotten away from ironing that way. I mean, think of it this way. Every time you got to go run over to the other side of the table and grab the iron. You know, um, if you can, like Susan does, you, same thing. I either hand press, you know, just use my finger. I haven't so much used the uh, ruler, but I don't have a wooden ruler. And I think that the little metal skinny rulers I use might be a little too rough on the fabric sometimes. That's the only reason I'm not really okay. aggressive with that on the, whereas mm -hmm. I think the wooden one might be a little gentler. And, but I um, have used this. I have used this. I've done exactly the same thing. And this is an eight inch wooden ruler, which you cannot buy. Right. right. You have to cut it off of a yardstick, but that right. is the size we need in the workroom. So okay. <laughs> exactly. you can get two from one rule, run yardstick and they're and, the yardstick are like a dollar. So and that's hard. another efficiency. You've, you've cut the ruler to the size you need it. So you don't right. even have to look at what you are measuring. Right. You know, it's eight inches. Yep. Right. Okay. Right. So what's the what best is, way to be set up for efficiency with ironing? Well, absolutely a track above yeah. your um, work table, uh, yeah, no it, whether you have what. a boiler iron or not. Right. Here's, my, right. here's my do fix making an appearance. It hangs from a track above my work table, which I, yes. I and it slides. I can reach it. Sometimes I have to really stretch if it's all the way across the table, but from most places at my work table, I can either reach the iron itself or reach the board to pull it towards me. So I make a few, few fewer steps because of that. <laughs> right, if right. you um, don't have a boiler iron and you are using um, a handheld iron, the reliable handheld iron is a boiler iron. God, that looks huge. <laughs> right here. That's more. That's better. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it does have a built-in boiler, so you can use this with the adhesive products that require a boiler iron. Yeah. Um, but even whatever iron you're using, we have some, um, the old uh, Black & Decker metal irons that the students use that are inexpensive and nice old metal irons. Mm -hmm. But you can set up a track over your work table. And if you go back to, on YouTube to the workroom channel, uh, workroom tours, um, the Denton Drapes workroom tour, in the UK, okay. um, she had her iron set up over the work table with a um, like rings mm -hmm. with the cord mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. affixed to the rings over a track, and, it, and it's really really simply done. And it's something that you can do easily um, right now with probably what you already have in your workroom. Okay, I'll put links to that in the show notes. So That's great. Thanks. Easily. Yeah, the track is um, very important because it does. Um, take the whole idea is to take the whole um, the, the cord and everything off the table and then I so I've got it up here too I don't know if you can see my track yes. and mine's just jerry rigged it's nothing fancy I didn't get the uh, and if I had I don't have a great ceiling to go into so every now and then once mm -hmm. I come crashing down 
But something I've done is I've also attached a extension cord and let mm -hmm. it come along and follow too. So right. that I've always got an extension cord if I want to use electric scissors or something. That's mm -hmm. right. Oh, that's smart. easy to grab. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I've, if you look behind me, you can see the orange things hanging from the wall. Those are the elect, their electrical cords on reels. Nice. And I have several of them around my workroom so that I can easily get to electricity when right. I need to. So yeah, I have I like on that side and some on this side of the room. I like those. So do you have recommendations about types of irons, Anne? Um, yeah, I was the Black and Decker girl for ever just because I was really good at dropping them off the edge of the table and at 15 bucks a piece it was like um but I had always and I'd always heard about the do fix um but I had always heard that it was high maintenance right and that was the, and, show the show the black and decker iron yes yes the little 25 guy. dollars they're 25 dollars yeah. now <laughs> oh gosh it used to be 15 um but um so a friend of mine closed her workroom and I got this uh do fix for a very, very good price. And honestly, all the reasons I wanted to give up ironing that it was slow, you know, it takes a while, especially with this handheld steam iron, it's slow going, you have to keep refilling it, it shuts itself off. Mm -hmm. Does that row does that reliable shut itself off? It Mine has an override. Yeah, it has okay. an override. Oh, okay, okay. Um, is this is just amazing and it makes ironing so fast yeah. and because the water is heated in the boiler it um uh doesn't heat up the, the 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 iron itself doesn't have to get as hot and so i can press out shears and casements and um fabrics that don't take heat really well right. much easier so um i in fact now when this thing goes into the shop i'm just like i hate this. <laughs> so I actually found another one on eBay for a fraction of the cost, and I now have a second one sitting on standby all the time. Yeah. So um, the right iron makes all the difference. Um, it just because it's um, having it on a rack, any iron on a rack really makes a difference in being able to grab it fast. But a do fix iron makes everything press faster. Yeah, and also um, the the balancer that keeps the iron at a at a level where you can still work on the table without having to move the iron. Right. Uh, that's also a game changer. Yeah, I just I just love that. Yeah, I yeah. mean mine I can have it down on the table and then when I let go it comes above it and if I I mean it's hanging a little bit low but I can just push it up and out of the way when I'm working mm -hmm. on the table with other things. Which nice. is actually a downside when you have to switch to a regular iron because you don't you let go and it doesn't go off. <laughs> oh, what is wrong with you? <laughs> oh, gosh, no, I'm supposed to set this one up. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> so what are some ways that we can be more efficient with cutting? Because that's I think something I spend way too much time doing. Oh, I'll go first. Okay. Um probably the first the thing for me is I make uh, things like linings, I do ballpark cuts. So I'm not um, measuring out if I need the, you know, just, I'm not determining the, the cut for my lining at the exact inch it needs to be and rolling it out and making sure it's exact. It's like, ah, oh, I need it around <laughs> 110 inches, you know, and I'm rolling it back and forth, cutting it out um, really fast. And having a gridded work table makes that go mm -hmm. even faster because I don't even have to get out a tape measure. I can just roll it out on the work table and um, when uh, cutting anything with a pattern repeat, you know, you're just folding back and forth to the pattern repeat and cutting out and not worrying about getting those exact cuts. Um, also cutting off selvages. Think about, are you gonna be trimming that off later? Because I, I know this from teaching classes that students are like wanting to trim everything. I'm like, well, when you fold over your hems, you're gonna have to trim away again. Right. Or, you know, mm -hmm. when you table your room and shade, you're gonna have to fold that over again. So think about, am I gonna be trimming this again later? that I don't need to cut it off now. Okay. How about you, Ann? Okay, so um, I'm more of the mind of cutting things to exact lengths so that I'm not trimming later because I can extra <laughs> step in the table. I love that, I process. love it. I do too. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and lining is, you know, kind of forgiving. So, uh, especially with the low bulk method we use, if the lining's like a half inch too short, it doesn't matter, it doesn't 
you know, show. So, um, and that was something I taught, was taught. Now, cutting face fabric to pattern repeat, yes. When you're cutting, you just cut to the pattern repeat. Just keep cutting the pattern repeat because you, you're going to trim when you table it. The yeah. lining, if you don't have to, you don't. Um, uh, I am not good about like um, stacking up a whole bunch of fabric if it's patterned, and, you know, like doing rough cuts and then stacking it all up and then cutting out one swag. I tend to cut them each, cut the first one and then use that one as patterns for all the rest, pillows and that sort of thing. So maybe I'm a little slow at, um, but- No, I think that's of, the most efficient way, Anne, is to cut out really one. In the long run? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I am efficient, yes. Uh, <laughs> as far as, like she, and she mentioned the gridded table uh, cover with linings, even the good heavy cotton linings I use, when you unroll it, you can see those lines yes. through the lining. You don't have to draw a line yeah. or you get that, um, um, what they call uh, the cutting guide from Shasta. Mm -hmm. And that makes it really easy. You just roll your fabric out to there and just run your scissors along that guideline um, to cut things. And stacking with panels. I teach in the class how to cut and stack your panels You um, so that when you're all done cutting and stacking, you just go straight to the machine and you don't, you don't pin anything. Your hems are already pinned in. So you take those, you know, you can get it. Um, you can take it straight to the machine. You can sew on any lead edge trim. You can sew all the seams. You push it over the blind hammer. You blind hem all the bottom uh, hems, and then you throw it on the rack, and it's ready to table one step. Okay. So uh, it's uh, thinking about how you're. The best way to be efficient is to think about if I had an employee and I had to hand this off to the next person in line, how would I explain it to them, or how would I make it easy for them so they got it right every time? Okay. That's a good way to think about it. Okay. Yeah, that's like great. That. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned pinning. Mm -hmm. Do you do a lot of pinning or not? Depends on what I'm working on, but I'm trying to get as much away from it as possible. Okay. So again, when you're cutting your widths of lining, you flip them over, you turn that two inch double hem, run Susan's ruler across it, <laughs> don't pin it because you can manage that two inches at the machine. Don't okay. pin it, don't put pins in. Don't, you don't have to take them out later. Um, if you are pinning bottom hems for anything and you put your pins six inches apart, start making them eight inches apart or 10 inches apart. Start thinking in terms of less pins instead okay. of more pins. And something I've learned recently that I need to train myself on that I haven't quite flipped over to yet is instead of pinning, start doing basting. If you were to take a long thread, you don't put a knot in it, you just leave a long tail and you just go along that bottom hem and you just take a basting stitch every six or eight inches as if you were pinning, when um, it's, it's about as fast as pinning, if not maybe a little faster. Mm -hmm. And when you're all done, you just like pull that thread out. Right, and it would take and less time than pulling the pins out. Exactly. And you're not losing pins all over the place or having to run around the room, look for your pins because you keep that long thread on your tool belt with your needle. Okay. So I was going to show you at my machine setup that I have a, a magnetic pin bowl at every single table. Yeah. Oh, I'm now thinking pins. that it's because I'm using too many pins. <laughs> and I, I mean, when I have back to put, a little bit. <laughs> when I have to put trim on the lead edge of a panel, I've got lots of pins in there to keep in control. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't have to, I could just use maybe a Dufix. Uh, they have a um, uh, basting tacky thing. Yeah, you know, I could probably use that or I could just do fix trim down. Um, I choose not to do that because no matter when I use any kind of adhesive, I make a mistake and then I have to take it out. <laughs> Whereas pins are much more forgiving. Um, so yes, in some places it is important to have pins, but like um, anytime you're sewing long seams or pattern matching. The workroom channel has a method share on how to do um, not pattern matching at the machine. Mm -hmm. And there's also one on doing taut sewing. Um, what I teach my students as a crutch that you wanna lose is when, when you're cutting your lining, just snip the salvage every 20 inches. Or if you're sewing together 
fabric that is solid and doesn't have a pattern repeat. You just nick the salvage every 20 inches, 30 inches, whatever. It's the easiest for you on both sides. As you're sewing, you're aligning those nicks. Okay, that's- Again, smart. you don't have to pin. You just use taut sewing and you can tell that you're staying level, that one layer isn't. Right. Um, so, uh, and, and then over time, as you realize that you are doing so well with your taut sewing technique, that you don't need the nicks anymore, then you get rid of them. Then you stop doing that. Okay. All right. Yeah. I, I think that um, the one pinning tip that I would share is to think about if you are pinning and going to the sewing machine or the blind hammer or the serger, think about how you're going to take them out. Mm -hmm. You're right handed if they're perpendicular and the, the head of the pen is on the right, mm -hmm. or they need to be facing so the head of the pen is at the is closest to you. Mm -hmm. You don't want to reach around behind a foot, especially at the surgery. <laughs> <I mean, Right. laughs> so you're always thinking, I'm pinning this, which direction am I going to be sewing it so that it's easiest to pull the pins out yeah. um, as you're sewing and, and mm -hmm. uh, not have them backed up on you. And it takes a little, sometimes I have to really think about it. Yeah. In the episode that we did, Susan, where you were showing hand sewing, um, I had asked you about the diagonal way that you put your straight pins in, and I've been trying yeah. to treat, teach myself to do that. But one of the things that I do when I'm doing my hems is I place the pin all the way down in the bottom so that when I sit at my blind hammer, I don't have to pull the pin. Yes. Out. I can yep. pull it back out when I come back to the table so they can stay in place. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the taut sewing and, and the pattern matching, I'll also put a link to that. It's it's in the library and it's also on the Workroom Channel's YouTube channel. That, Anne, has been my favorite way to pattern match and I've gotten better and better about that as time goes right. by, but it's still, I'll finish and go, look at that, that's so <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I love teaching that method because yes. it's like magic. Nobody believes it works. Right. It works. You, <laughs> when you taught it in the class that I attended, the workroom skills class, there were people who had never tried it before. And I absolutely loved watching their faces when they got to the end. I know. Every piece, every part, like, every part of the pattern match, not some of it, but all of it. <laughs> um, does anybody use anything else besides um, basting or pinning? Because I've used, I don't have to, I've used these little clip pins. Um, these are sometimes I, I have those yeah. uh, for something that um, I can't remember what I used them for recently, Blackout. probably velvet or, or something like that. Um, they, they're kind of clunky and <laughs> get in the way. And, and they need a separate um, action at the, t at the right. sewing machine. To right, right, right. All right. So I will, I'm going to teach everybody a little trick I taught. I was taking some knitting classes and the knitting teacher told us you should keep one of these in your car and sit. And, and if you're at a red light, just squeeze it back <laughs> and forth and use each finger to squeeze it because it strengthens okay. your hands. And I will tell you that the ring finger is extremely difficult without using the other fingers. And I have a little bit of arthritis in my hands and this has actually helped. It's, it's like physical therapy for my hands. So I have one of these <laughs> attached to the air vent in my car. And when I'm at a red light, I will sit and squeeze the little thing. I'm sure I've had a few people pull up next to me and think, what is that woman doing? I don't care if my hands are. All right, I'm going to take it one up on you, Seal. Okay, I'm what's that? Stop light and go like this. <laughs> <laughs> Susan is using one of the giant clamps. <laughs> oh, sorry, folks. Yeah. Yeah, that those looks like those old exercise, those hand things. They are. Yeah. Things are right. You're right. <laughs> but I mean, let's be honest. If we're going to be efficient in our workroom for years to come, we need to take care of ourselves. And let me tell oh, you, exactly. these, um, it's talking about efficiency, these workroom clamps are, are under the sides of each one of our work tables. So yes. I've got four to six right there where I need them mm -hmm. all the time. Right. So, you know, they're, they're right there. I just okay. reach down and grab them. It's great. Yeah, I've got mine right here too, but I don't have those ones because they're too hard on the hands. These are the ones you want. Yes. <laughs> because they're all, you know, one-handed. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Those so much are great. Nicer. Yeah. And as far as pinning, um, uh, the only other time I, I don't use regular pins is when um, I'm working with black outside hems. Mm -hmm. So then I use the uh, plastic covered um, Paper clips. Okay, yeah. that's a great idea. And yeah, I use 
I use the little clippy ones when I'm using blackout fabric because it won't mark them um, and it won't put holes in them. Now you mentioned the clamps for anybody who's watching this on YouTube, you can see a shelf right over my head. Um, I will sometimes clamp balances to the underside of that board, but I keep the clamps on top of it for two reasons. They're right there where I need them when I'm clamping them. Yeah. But if I need to use them on my table, they're right here and there. I can reach yeah. back and grab them. Um, Another, I, keep, uh, I'll, I'll I keep them on the other side. Go, um, go sorry, ahead. I'm just talking over you, Seal. That's okay. <laughs> I keep them on the other side of the table too, so that I can reach them. But I'm standing at the spot where I work most often, like you mentioned, Anne. This is my spot, right? right. right. And sorry, that's, yeah, that's where everything should be centered. Yeah. yeah. But and, um, and an alternative to pinning is also the fabric stapler. Yes. Yeah. So, and so that that is in my tool for, belt. Um, in, okay. in, in Ann's tool belt. They won't fit in my tool belt. Okay. Um, so, so because this is my spot where I stand, you mentioned, and I'm going to turn my iPad back on. I have, I got to turn it around, sorry. Under my table, I have a shelf where mm -hmm. I keep my rollers. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Most of the length of the table, mm -hmm. but then I have down here, I nice. have scissors, my stapler, and that, that's a pair of scissors for opening really rough packages. And gotcha. I keep a couple more rulers and my tape measure down there. I have my tape, my blue tape. They're all, but they're all on this side because mm -hmm. this is where mm -hmm. I stand. Another thing that you can add under your work table, and I don't have it here, um, but I always had it at my mom's <laughs> workroom and, and my workroom, is just to buy a cheap tool belt and just staple it under the table. Well, that's a good idea. Yeah. So huh. just, you know, it, it gives you pockets and things that you can put right. things in. Right. But it also can get filled up with junk. So you have to, you have to watch. <laughs> I said you have to watch. Yes. Yeah. So go back there later and go, oh, there's half that candy bar I was eating. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's actually a good question. Do either of you allow food or drink in your workroom? Definitely candy bars. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll show you the, uh, hold on a second. Here we go. I have these little signs for when I need them. No food or drinks on the work tables. Okay. Yeah. So there's no food or drink on my work table, but I, I'm kind of a coffee addict. I'm kind of drinking coffee all day long. So I have my Contigo cup and I have my water bottle. They have closed lids and I keep them. I have a small desk uh, over in the corner. I right. keep them over there to avoid Problem. One of the, um, I saw this at a uh, camping um, store. Don't ask me why we were there. Okay. <laughs> it was another, <laughs> but um, they have these big clips with a cup holder on it. Oh. To use like in an RV? Yeah. So you could clip it to the side you of your work table. To the work table. <laughs> and then I was thinking, well, what else could I put in there? You know, I could put a glue bottle in there. Right. Right. So I'm, I might have to like go that. online and, and buy some of those. And uh, you can, you can, could be handy. I could put a spool of thread. In. I don't know, but you I was thinking that would be a great course. place to put a water bottle or yes. get it off the work table. I like that. Okay. Yeah. All I right. have, um, I bring my last cup of coffee down every morning mm -hmm. and put it on the shelf over here. If there's anything in front of it, like something hanging on a stand, I very carefully move the coffee <laughs> around there. And, um, and then about two, three days later, I carry it back upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> I do keep water over there. And what I try to do during the day is I set, I tell um, uh, my phone, set the timer for 30 minutes, an hour, whatever. And then that reminds me to go over and take a good slug of water. Okay. And that's the yeah. only way I remember to stay hydrated. <laughs> okay. So we've talked about trying to train ourselves and things like that. So how do we focus more on efficiency and what do we have to do to make it more of a priority in our workrooms? You have to just make it front of mind and be thinking about it. So yesterday, you know, I was thinking about this discussion and everything. And for some reason, the pins were just out to get me yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> out to get me, yeah. to the, you know, bleeding all over everything. I had to go get bandages twice. And the bandages are in the other, in the machine room, way in the corner, in the first aid corner. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, well, this is inefficient. Right. <laughs> so I got a bunch and I put them in one of the drawers here. So okay. 
it's it's every little stupid thing as you're working when you come up against something that makes you stop and think god this always takes too long even if it takes a minute and you're just like so crazy. then you gotta start thinking about what can i do to make it shorter or to eliminate <laughs> it or you know whatever and it's it just has to be a, a top ahead thing but some people could get kind of crazy with it and almost too um you know and, and they set up all sorts of little things or whatever that kind of takes you back in the wrong direction okay you have to be kind of careful with that okay yeah, I, I i agree that um like putting the band-aids where you need them yeah even though you have a first aid kit right right, <laughs> yeah. right. Um, it's it's the same thing we were talking earlier about uh throwing stuff on the floor instead of putting it in a trash can which i think is, is sort of dangerous especially we have a wood floor here it's slippery um and I have lots of trash cans, but I often find myself taking five or six steps to the trash can when I could just move the trash can. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Just like you could just move the band-aids. Right. So I don't care how 30 plus years and I'm still going, why don't you just move the trash can mm -hmm. over <laughs> to where you need it to be? You know, yeah. it's just, um, it's not front of mind. You're not thinking right. and um, you need to tune in. And yes. a lot of times we're really yeah. distracted mm -hmm. and, um, you know, turn off. I don't have any notifications. I do have my cell phone on in case, you know, I have a phone call or something that I, I need to take, but I don't have any notifications turned on. Um, right. Often I, I put it on do not disturb, which is a great, you know, I can still use my phone, but um, it's not going to get, when I have those dings, right. And emails showing up. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's hard to ignore Put them. on music, podcast, something that, makes you um work in a nice flow mm -hmm. and if that if, if the one thing that you can learn from talking um listening to us today is just get in the groove you know get in that groove you're a well-oiled machine yeah <laughs> yeah and I don't let argue. things distract you and i know those of you that have kids at home it must be almost impossible i i'm, oh, fun. I'm in <laughs> awe <laughs> Um, I would argue that podcasts or books on tape would work against you in terms of efficiency because you're paying attention to that and not attention to inefficiencies. You know, it's like mm. maybe sometimes work in peace and quiet and just focus on what you're doing and think about what you're doing as opposed to, um, and here I'm talking at everybody out of listening to us right now. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I think when you're because uh, I know I do books on tape in the car and I love them and I just have resisted the urge to bring them down here and I love to set up podcasts and listen to them all the time down here when I get but only when I'm working on something super boring. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm, right, right. I can't right, do right. Um, numbers. Yeah, if no, I don't no, have a figure, no. you know, Roman shade ring spacing or a quote <laughs> or something, I cannot have anything yeah. on in the back. Right, right. Um, yeah, Susan, you mentioned um, about your phone i have accidentally had my phone on do not disturb and been in my work room thinking wow i'm so efficient today <laughs> there are like 15 phone calls that i've missed but that just proves the point that i mean most people can't stop what they're doing and take phone calls for their job and we have every right to block off time to be in our work rooms and be efficient um but we we really didn't talk too much about time studies. And I know that people feel differently about time studies. I'm curious, um, do either of you still do time studies? Yeah, I was doing one this week. Um, it was for a class uh, to let students know how long something should take on average. Mm -hmm. But um, even, you know, time studies are amazing for when you're working on your pricing. And that's, you know, we've talked about it, Seal and I, on, and Anne in her classes, we've talked about on this podcast. But also, if you're doing a time study, you are much more focused on your job. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because you know you're timing yourself. Yes, exactly. So even if for no other reason, even though you're not using it for your pricing and, and for quoting, uh, just do a time study and you'll be really surprised at how efficient you become. Totally. And I think that's the key. And I remember immediately after taking your class, and one of the things that I did was pay more attention to how long things were taking and do comparisons. So um, there were a few things with tabling and making panels that you taught me that I did it my old way. And then I did it the way you taught me, probably forgetting several things along the way. 
but I was really pleased with the difference. And I think it, it, knowing the difference makes it then that much easier to remember to do something a little differently. Or as you said, like, all right, is there a faster way to do this? Could I be doing this in a way that, that speeds me up a little bit? So, right, right. Yeah, I think we can be resistant to learning mm -hmm. and, and oh, doing yeah. things that might be better. Um, for something as simple as sewing on Roman shade rings, there's several different methods. I've tried different ones and I always go back to the one, the way I sew on rings because I've timed myself and I know right. that I'm faster at right. doing it that way. But, but you know, and so I know. if it comes I up in conversation <laughs> and, and I remember this from our class, there were several things that people were just like gobsmacked, like oh, this is going to be so much faster. And, and even Elkie Horn, who was in the class, who had been in business for 30 years, there were things that she was like, oh, I'm going to try that. And then there were things she was like, yeah, my girls are not going to do that any differently. This, they're doing it the best way possible for them. Right. But you don't know if you don't look at the other options. And, mm -hmm. and if we're trying to be efficient, we can't try every single way there is and compare them. But if we try a couple ways and go, okay, I'm still faster the way I do it, then go off and do you. <laughs> and it can be faster or may not be as fast, but you like the quality better or you're more secure in the end result. Agreed. I mean, everything doesn't have to be faster. I think um, a perfect example of that would be blind hemming, mm -hmm. whether you should hand him while it's on the table or get it pinned and to the blind hammer and blind him and back to the table. Good there's exactly. sometimes when the blind hammer machine would be faster and there's sometimes when it would just be better to leave it on the work table. Yes, exactly. And that comes from experience, trying to decide which way to go. With exactly. That. exactly, exactly. So our, our 30 minute with workroom tech podcast has gone a bit longer than 30 minutes. We were not efficient in our, in our podcasting today. I disagree. We were very efficient. We packed a lot of information in this podcast. Um, but, Anne, thank you so much for joining us. And I know I've mentioned taking the class a couple of times. I know you're going to be holding the class at workroom tech. When is that so that people can know and sign up for it? Okay, keep me straight here, Sue. It's <laughs> June 15th to 18th. It's a Thursday to Saturday. And I'm so excited because I want to see this new uh, building of yours and, yeah. and try it out. But uh, yeah, in June, we're going to, uh, uh, you can email me and, uh, and reach out and we'll get you signed up. All right. I and will the registration for that class is through Anne, it's through not me, through yes. Workroom okay. Tech. So right, um, right. you can go on our website and uh, there is a little message on there that, that uh, the class is happening, but you'll need to email Anne to okay, register. Cool. And, and, and I'll put um, Anne she'll send email. you. Okay. And she'll send you the information about lodging and, and visiting yes, Workroom yes, Tech yes, here in North Carolina. Carolina. And, it'll and be beautiful just, June. It'll be oh so nice. my gosh. Oh, I know. Perfect timing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> just a free plug from me. And your class taught me a great deal. I learned a lot from you. I learned a lot from the other people in the class. Yeah. But, but most important was um, you gave us a booklet that everything that you taught was in there. So I could refer back to it afterwards because we all know we, we do these classes and then later we're like, I know I learned more than I'm remembering, <laughs> but I, we uh, had it all with us. And it really did change how I felt about running my workroom in terms of getting things done. And again, it's not always about fast, but right. what is the best way for me to be doing this? So if you're listening and you're even thinking twice about it, call me. I, I will set you straight <laughs> on why you should take Anne's class. I'm a big proponent of it. So I think the things that we talked about kind of indicate it's not about great big changes. It's about small oh. incremental changes and things that we make habits in our activities and our work yeah. room. So I would love to hear from anybody listening if there are things you've learned from Anne or Susan that you've changed in your workroom that you're doing a little bit differently. We would love to hear about it. And um, I, Anne, thank you so much. This has been fun. And as always, I learned something from you. Oh, thank you. I appreciate being invited on. It's been fun. I, I've uh, loved being in all of your workrooms this morning. Yeah. Okay, so if you only listen to the podcast, there'll be a YouTube link. You can go and see what, what we're talking about and see everything all behind us. But thank you so much. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.